Welcome to Old Parliament House, the Museum of Australian Democracy. I'm Daryl Karp. I'm the director of the museum. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting, the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people, and pay my respects to elders past and present and future. We're gathered today in the members' dining room in Old Parliament House, which is celebrating its 90th birthday. This was the place where MPs and senators would meet for, for meals from both sides of parliament, sit together. Uh, it was also the place where we had state receptions and formal dinners for important guests like yourselves. Or in 1954, the royal banquet given by the then Prime Minister Menzies and his wife Patty for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II uh, and His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh. Or my personal favourite, the 50th birthday party in May 1980 for Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser. You can just imagine that one in Senate Estimates today. <laughs> we are really honoured to be part of the events that are put together by the Institute of Governance and Policy Analysis at the University of Canberra. It is a really important uh, and critical partnership for the Museum of Australian Democracy, particularly as democracy and anxiety. Uh, particularly as anxiety about democracy deepens around the world. It's um, a really terrific relationship. I think you're about to uh, be really inspired by the research that comes out of that place, but also to be inspired by the conversation that we're about to hear tonight. So without much more ado, I would like to invite our moderator for the evening, Virginia Hausiger, to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daryl, indeed. It's a delight to stand on this stage. It's a delight for me to be in this room, not just because it's the 90th birthday, but this week, some years ago, I had my wedding celebration in this room. And my husband's even turned up to mark the moment, which is amazing, because he never turns up at anything I do. So thank you, Mark. <laughs> now, we are here for a very important discussion today. Trust, populism, and the ideal politician. I think each and every one of us have a lot to say about all those themes, particularly the last one. We're in for a feast of thought with an excellent panel lineup, and I will introduce them a little later on. But first, an overview. Australians should, of course, rightly be proud of our hard-won democratic traditions and freedoms and the achievement of stable government. However, these things are increasingly under threat. There's concerning evidence of a growing discontent between government and citizens and a decline in satisfaction with our democracy. An increasing distrust in politicians and political parties has spread to other key institutions also. Overall, we are witnessing an erosion of public confidence in the capacity of governments of whatever colour to address public policy concerns. The gap between reality and how Australians imagine their democracy has widened to such a degree that we need to stop and pause, listen and reflect on whether our democracy can in fact adapt to the new realities of the 21st century. So tonight we're asking why this dramatic decline in trust is the calibre of politicians to blame. What can be done to reverse the trend? And what does the ideal politician look like? What does she do? How does she engage? What are her motivational drivers? Ah, you're all laughing. I wonder why. Should she be a she at all? And of course, we'll be asking, what is the responsibility of citizens, all of us? We're very fortunate to have some of the best thinkers around issues of democracy based here in Canberra at UC's IGPA the Institute for Governance and Policy Analysis, which of course is home to the Centre for Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance. And heading IGPA's Brain Trust is Professor Mark Evans. Mark is going to kick off our discussion this evening with a short overview of what IGPA's research on democracy and trust is telling us thus far. Over to you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. And thank you to Daryl as well for your very generous words. This has been a wonderful partnership to be involved in. Um, over the last three years, we, we have had the, uh, the opportunity with the Museum of Australian Democracy to uh, 
to undertake three national surveys on how Australians imagine their democracy. And over the last year, we've been able to um, engage in 10 focus groups, and Michelle Grattan as well has been intimately involved in that focus group activity. We've got another four to do over the next few months, but we've been focusing sharply on the issue of, well, how do Australians imagine their democracy? And in particular, how do they perceive their politicians, political parties, and political institutions? Now, I'm going to be very quick, because Virginia has given me a very tight, uh, tight um, um, amount of time to, to provide this quick overview. So I'm going to go straight to, to, to our findings. Um, now, for anybody who's interested, um, in your handout on your seats, you have reference to where you can find all the reports that we've done for the Museum of Australian Democracy that provides more detail on the findings that I'm going to present to you now. Um, now, satisfaction with democracy in Australia is now at its lowest levels since 1996. And what is particularly interesting is the way in which there's been a very sharp decline since the end of the Howard government um, in 2007. Um, the first point I want to make is that this is not a party political observation. This has been a problem with all governments in power over that period. Levels of trust in government and politicians in Australia are now at their lowest levels since 1993. And remarkably, this increases with age. Older Australians or the baby boomer Australians are now more dissatisfied with their democracy than indigenous Australians, which is a startling, startling observation. Because of course, that group of people have benefited most from 25, 26 years of economic growth. Party loyalty is also at its lowest level since 1967, which explains why there's a space for independents and independent parties to challenge the established political order. But fundamentally, interest in politics is very, very high. We, we have a very knowledgeable citizenry that's passionate about its politics. It just doesn't like the politics that's on display in what we term the magic kingdom, up on the hill, adversarial politics, politics as blood sport. We trust governments to address national security issues, but little else. Trust drives limited public confidence in the ability of government to perform core tasks. Trust drives limited public confidence in government to address public policy fundamentals. There is only one area where government is at the moment perceived to be doing a good job, and that is in relation to security and defense issues. But interesting enough, trust is not yet driving political participation. So we're not seeing riots on the streets. We're not seeing the same type of protest activity that we're witnessing in Europe in, in particular. In our focus groups, we asked Australians what they thought the ideal politician would look like. And actually, in the first range of focus groups that we undertook in regional Australia, we actually um, did the focus groups in, in the constituency of Indi. And um, Cathy McGowan actually came, this was before the last election, Cathy McGowan actually came out as, a, as like an exemplar politician in this regard, which is why we've invited here to, today. Four key things, honesty. Um, the ideal politician for Australians must be honest, trustworthy, and ethical. Local, they should know the area. They should be approachable and accessible. Empathy, they should be empathetic. Who listens to them? Who communicates and follows up? And then finally, delivery, somebody who fights for them, who understands that trust is earned. So some quick quotations to end with. From an urban male Australian, at the moment, a lot of politicians go into politics for advancement rather than service, turning out clones of media-savvy people with sound bites and platitudes. It feels like they're manufactured. Keeping your word, that's a big thing with me. Don't tell me you're going to do something and not do it, because I'll never trust you again, an elderly regional Australian. We need to get more involved. But they don't have time for us and our views, apart from election time. Maybe that's what they need to change. They need to be as interested in us and our views when they've been elected, a first-time voter. 
However, we also need to recognize that this is a global phenomenon. In the recent Edelman, Edelman um, Global Index, 75% of democracies in the world today, right, the majority of people in those countries have a significant, significant low levels of trust in their government. So this is a global phenomenon. Right? We have to recognize that. Also need to recognize that actually people feel more fondly about their local representative. So they're talking about the, the politicians as a, as a cohort, right? not individuals, which is also um, important. But what is significant about these findings is that we've had 25 years of economic growth. We haven't witnessed the depth of global financial crisis that's, for example, hollowed out the public sector in many countries um, in Europe. So, tonight we have an opportunity to pause, listen, and reflect on whether our democracy can adapt to the new realities of 21st century governance. Now, the findings here do make difficult reading for Australian political parties and mainstream media as well, because the media have a role, to, have, uh, according to our Australians, the media is a, plays a significant role in this issue. Um, but we also have strong clues as to how to respond. Now, we call this research the Power of Us survey. And the data will inform the design of a new exhibition to be launched here in Old Parliament House in March 2018. And a charter for Australian democracy will form the centrepiece of this new exhibition. So we urge you to go and have a look at our draft charter that we've developed here in Australia with the participation of a whole range of different people from different walks of life in Australia and tell us what you think. But for now, to Virginia and to our conversation. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much indeed. I'll do a very quick, brief introduction of our panellists, although I think all of them need very little introduction. But hopefully I can tell you something a little that you may not have known about them. To my far left here, Senator Linda Reynolds, a Lib Liberal member from WA. Uh, Linda entered the Senate in 2014. She has over 20 years experience in national and political levels working for ministers and members of parliament and served as the deputy director, federal director of the Liberal Party. But she also has spent three decades uh, working as an army reservist in a number of roles around governance and advisory and in fact was the first woman in the Australian Army Reserves to be promoted to the rank of brigadier. So you may not have known that about Linda. And well, I'll go through them all. There's plenty to applaud, but don't applaud because otherwise we'll be here all night. Now, next, next to Linda, of course, is Cathy. And uh, as Mark said, Cathy uh, certainly stood out in our research work. Cathy is an independent for Indi. When she uh, unseated Sophie Mirabella, that caused a great upset. And she, uh, she developed a very strong following at the time. Cathy is also has a uh, qualifications in economics and agriculture and began her working life in rural Victoria as a teacher. And her career in agriculture and community politics spans decades. She has also won an Order of Australia for her work, a National Centenary Medal and an award and been awarded a Churchill Fellowship. Next to Cathy is Luke, Luke Gosling from the ALP, a member, is the member for Solomon, the Northern Territory, and entered Parliament in that capacity in 2016. Luke started his working life with Defence, spending 13 years in the Army. We've got quite a Defence theme going on tonight. He has done some very interesting work, particularly around Timor-Leste, working, uh, set up an NGO called the Life, Love and Health Organisation, a not-for-profit, uh, and has worked with Australian volunteers in Timor-Leste and also as an advisor to the president of Timor-Leste. Very interesting background. Michelle Grattan needs very little introduction to any of you. Of course, Michelle has been part of our political life and our media landscape for as long as I can remember and has spent a number of years in the press gallery at all sorts of levels and, of course, was the first woman to edit a uh, mainstream uh, capital city newspaper, being the Canberra Times. She currently is the uh, professional fellow at the University of Canberra. We're very, very grateful for that and is the chief political correspondent for 
the conversation and of course is a regular commentator across media, particularly ABC Radio National and you can often hear her in the mornings with Fran Kelly. And next to Michelle, John Stanhope of course needs very little introduction too. John was the Chief Minister here in the ACT for 10 years and uh, has a very strong and long background in politics. Most recently, after he ended his term as Chief Minister, he moved out to the far-flung Christmas Islands as administrator for a couple of years. Administrator of Christmas Islands and the Cocoa Islands. And is currently employed as an advisor at the Wananga Nimitia Aboriginal Health and Community Service. And we're very, very fortunate to have him also as an adjunct at IGPA, the Institute for Governance, and also an academic associate of the 5050 by 2030 Foundation. I just anointed you. <laughs> <laughs> and Mark, of course, you've met. So we're going to dive straight into our discussion um, because we don't have a great deal of time tonight, but I do urge you to save up your questions because we want to spend at least half of our discussion time taking questions from the floor to really get the conversation going. I'm going to throw straight to, to you, Luke, as a politician. We've already spoken about the fact that there is a major decline, a significant, significant decline uh, in trust of our politicians. Is that a problem? Yeah, it's a, it's a big problem, particularly uh, being one. You uh, hope that uh, your constituents, um, having voted for you, have some trust in you, that you will help them uh, realise their potential, their dreams for themselves and their families, uh, protect them from that which they seek to be protected from, uh, but also provide some inspiration. Is uh, it a misplaced problem though? Uh, is the public getting it wrong? No, the public always get it right. Um, <laughs> and I've, I found that out in 2013 when I was defeated in a, in a federal election, uh, narrowly mind. Um, but I did look, <laughs> I did look at, um, you know, how I could engage more with the community uh, and very much in my mind was winning their trust. So when I got a 7% swing in 2016, um, I think I got uh, to a better feel for the community and had at some level won their uh, trust. And when I look around at my colleagues uh, in the chamber, there's really high calibre people there that I think are there because they have won uh, some trust at some level. Cathy, over to you. You did an extraordinary thing in India, as, as I said, um, caused a great upset when you, you took that seat from the Liberal Party. What is it about the voice of India, the independent, that do you think captured the imagination of the electorate in a way that the major parties failed to do? So, <laughs> I think a couple of things around this one. I'm a local to the community that I represent and my ancestry goes back a long way. That's really important. We were very, very unhappy with our representation and we'd hoped that it would get better, but it didn't. So we uh, epitomised that lack of trust. We could see it wasn't working for us. The party system wasn't working for us. We were being taken for granted. The local member of parliament often didn't turn up to events, really didn't show she cared. So. It wasn't just the lack of trust, it was poor representation and ineffective representation. So when the system was so obviously cracked that we thought we could, as rural people, push the system and split it open. So uh, Leonard Cohen's got a great song, you know, when, the, when it cracks, let the light in. So I actually think that that's what happened. We thought we had a chance. If it had been a strong member and even if politics hadn't been working at the top, we would never have felt a little bit confident. So that was one thing. There was a crack in the system and we were clever enough to think we could push it enough and maybe not one election, maybe two elections, it mm. would open. And we'd seen the experience that had happened in New England and uh, with Ro um, Rob Oakeshott that we knew that um, in, if you can get a rural and regional person up as an independent, you've got a lot of power. Now, you didn't actually have to have the balance of power it's the threat of the balance of power that makes a difference. So I think we were really pragmatic people who thought we could do better. And the surprising thing for us, we, we didn't actually get the trust bit at the beginning, but when we did the analysis of how are we going to win, we knew that being strategic about it, we had to convince people that they could trust me and us. So that became one of our campaign things. 
And how we did it was we used really traditional community uh, building techniques, small groups, which is basically what the parties are designed on, small groups of local people connecting you up. We had to build them because they weren't actually there. Um, they were sort of, they were sort of uh, nasciently there. We had to get them organised. But that's what really worked because everybody knew somebody who 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 was in the campaign. So that was what we actually did. So, so we built that trust to actually provide, we, we trust, trust us, trust community, and we might be able to change the system. So some very strong uh, community networking grassroots behaviours there and, and resorting, I think, to some very old-fashioned um, grassroots work. Linda, from where you sit, the issue of trust, is this something that you feel that you have to uh, fight back against this, this decline in trust or is it not showing itself where you are? I, in relation to the report that we've just seen, there is absolutely nothing in there that is a surprise. And in fact, if you've got a group of politicians on a bipartisan basis to sit down and tell us what we think people think, it would be very similar you know, to that. And but I does, it, does it disappoint you? Um, no, look, it doesn't disappoint me. It doesn't surprise me. And I do a lot of work overseas in a lot of emerging democracies and helping people find their voice campaign. And it doesn't surprise me. But what it does tell us is that we've got a lot of work to do as a nation. And it's a wake-up call because there is no such thing as a perfect democracy. And, you know, as Winston Churchill said, it's the best of the, the worst form. But we don't often stop to think about what that actually means. And it means we cannot ever take it for granted because democracy is built on people. So just as uh, you know, us who go into politics are human, just like everybody else, we're fallible, we've got all the same foibles and everything else as everybody else, but democracy only works if the power is with, you know, if you've got the title, the power is with the people. And if you've got people who are very disempowered, disengaged, very angry and upset, then that is not a functioning democracy and everything we see in this report and everything we see every day re reflects that. So I think that it's a, it's a great, you know, in terms of this and other discussions, it's a great wake-up call for us all is that we've got to actually get together and reimagine our democracy. I mean, we as people haven't changed. I've got a great um, cartouche right on top of my computer in my office here, and it's uh, from 1827, and it's got the Duke of Wellington with a little light out there, and it, the joke is it's uh, Diogenes, you know, the ultimate cynic in search of an honest ministry. Mm. And so, you know, concern about politics and politicians has always waxed and waned. But it's how we come together to refresh our democracy. And, you know, politics has changed. People's aspirations haven't changed. But, you know, we don't politic and campaign on issues and policies as we used to. So it's, it's now very different. And just on that, what gives me huge hope, no matter what you think about the same-sex... Uh, ballot, survey, whatever we call it, it, that more than anything else should give us great hope about our democracy because it shows when you ask people what they think, they will talk about it, sometimes not as respectfully as they should, but they talk about it and in a voluntary basis they are having their say and young Australians are having their say. So I think in terms of dealing with that, there is some answers in there for all of us, is how to actually get people to have their say, re-engage and not just expect those of us here to be able to fix it. We'll come back to the, uh, how we might reimagine democracy, but John, I want to throw it over to you now and um, get your thoughts about the calibre of politicians and is a declining <laughs> calibre of, of politician to, to blame here? And one of the things I'll, I'll add to that is on this very stage when we had the Democracy 100 event here, John Howard and, and um, Bob Hawke had a wonderful discussion and both of them spoke about their disappointment at seeing so many career politicians coming through, people who didn't have a life outside of politics. Now our current politicians all have had very rich lives outside of politics, but a lot don't. So tell us your thoughts about the calibre of politicians. Um, well it's always difficult for politicians to talk about the calibre of perhaps other politicians. So I'm now an ex-politician. Oh, no, it's but, not at um, all. <laughs> um, but I do have views on the subject. I, I, sh <laughs> I think it's also interesting and probably worth saying that you know, I'm, uh, I was a 
a, 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 a politician here at a territory level. Uh, I think a lot of the work that uh, Marx described earlier actually relates very much to our federal parliament and to perceptions around our federal politicians. I think it is interesting uh, to actually perhaps ponder whether or not there is a difference in attitude to the way or, or perception of state and territory of politics and politicians as opposed to our federal parliament and federal politicians. I was elected in 1998. Uh, we were flogged, the Labor Party, in that election. We won 27% of the popular vote. I won uh, government in 2001. Uh, the ALP has now been in government in the ACT for 17 years. At the time of the next election, the ALP will have been in government in the ACT for 20 years. Um, it's uh, a record that's actually not reflective of a, and uh, I think this is something that the Canberrans, my fellow Canberrans, need to reflect on, that the people of Canberra have been happy to trust the ALP uh, in government in the ACT for 20 uh, uninterrupted years. 20 uninterrupted years is a long time. Is it too long? Well, that's probably another discussion. Um, uh, and I, th I think my, my colleagues are now ref reflecting very closely on that, most particularly in relation to the very recent, uh, in their very recent engagement actually with IGPA and issues around uh, an engagement or a closer engagement with notions of deliberative democracy. They're trialling. Uh, um, they're trialling a, a citizen's jury here, which I think re reflects another challenge for people that actually are concerned about politics and politicians and uh, questioning whether or not they should trust politicians. The government, you know, to its credit, has engaged, is, uh, has uh, set out on a trial, a citizen's jury, contacted 6,000 Canberrans to be jurists on the, our first ever uh, jury and 127 of the 6,000 people contacted uh, agreed to participate. Almost self-selected, uh, Mark would know better than me, but here's a challenge to any Canberran that says, oh, they're not engaging, we don't get an opportunity to be part of the process. The ACT government has just contacted 6,000 people directly uh, to be part of a deliberative process and 5,900 of them said no thanks. On the question of the calibre of politicians, I think it is an issue. Uh, and I think one of, one of the big issues in relation to the, the findings that Mark revealed in relation to trust at a federal level has been uh, concern around, the, most particularly the last 10 years, and it was interesting that uh, the issues around trust in politicians, uh, a significant date was 2007, the end of the Howard era and the election of Rudd. And uh, I'm, I'm prepared to say, and everybody knows it as a fact, the last 10 years federally have not been pretty. Uh, and I think all Australians have a right uh, to be very, very concerned at the behaviour of our federal representatives so, over the last but 10 John, years. Are you seeing the calibre of politicians d decline on, on, on both sides, or all sides? Um, I don't know whether that, whether that is fair, but I think one of the issues that needs to be looked at is the calibre of, po I believe it myself, and I'm very critical of the pre-selection processes. Not so much, I think the, the election of politicians is essentially a merit process when we go to the ballot box and we make a decision that which we we hope I hope we we base on on merit though those of us with strong party affiliations probably put it to the side to some extent but I'm very concerned about the uh, the lack of democracy within both the Labor Party and the Liberal Party as I perceive it I don't know the Liberal Party as well I'm concerned about the done deals in relation to pre-selection the, the Labor Party particularly through the factions which are controlled by the unions uh, you know, it's a fiction to suggest that a rank and file member of the Labor Party has a snowflake chance in hell of ever being pre-selected. You could be a Nobel Prize winner, a Rhodes Scholar, and represent or, or pl play for Richmond and, 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 and miss out uh, on pre-selection if the job's already gone to, say, an ex-president of the ACTU or some such. It's the, the deal's done and merit doesn't count. I think there's a significant issue in relation to leadership, the, the, the calibre of our leaders, and certainly my concern is about um, the extent to which, I think most particularly in the Senate, um, you know, the jobs are doled out very much in the Labor Party on the basis of whose turn it is. 
rather than on merit. Given all of that, is it any wonder that uh, citizens are, are increasingly disgruntled by our political process? But I, I just want to throw it over to Michelle now um, and pick up on the issue of populism itself. Given what we've heard and given what the data is telling us, the research is telling us about what, how the electorate feels, um, is there space for an emerging popul popularism in Australia? Well, I think we have seen that and uh, we uh, the, the way it's come through is that you get minor parties which uh, arise on the back of this discontent and uh, in recent times, of course, we've, we've had the Palmer Party. It came in and then blew up and, and blew out. Mm. And in a way, I think the Hanson phenomenon is the same sort of thing. Mm. So we've had for quite a long time centre parties and the voting system in the Senate gives them a, a, a special leg up. But uh, years ago, of course, we had a, a more moderate uh, literal centre party in the Australian Democrats, but now we have these uh, more fly-by-night uh, parties reflecting disillusionment, not, not just uh, differences with the major parties. John Howard uh, made a comment recently in, in Sydney Morning Herald that he uh, thought the media was largely responsible for giving politics such a bad name and putting people off careers as politicians. Is that a, a little fair? I think we operate in... Um, partnership with the politicians, actually, in, in that. I think we're both to blame, both groups are to blame. I think that the politicians, interestingly, as they've become more professionalised, uh, they've become uh, figures that invite more cynicism. Now, there is a paradox here, of course, the more professionally trained your doctor is, the, the better he or she would be, but the trouble with the politicians being so professionally trained is that they end up all saying the same thing and uh, reflecting the same lines, and really that is treating the public with a good deal of disdain. Beyond that, they also behave badly. Uh, something I've never quite understood. Everybody knows, all the politicians here, know that the public hate the bad behaviour they see in Parliament. And you talk to politicians and they say, yes, yes, that's so, but they never change. And yet it would be so easy to change, one would think. <laughs> They've got various explanations about, you know, giving the other side too much room and so on and, and just the heat of the moment. But I think that that is a problem. And when you go to the media side, you find that the media increasingly trivialises things. People, there's too much media from the point of view of the ordinary person. They see all this stuff, it's in their face all the time. Mm. When, if you went back half a century, of course, mm. the, they wouldn't see a lot of it. For example, they wouldn't see what happens in Parliament. And uh, I think that the media's, um, the amount of it and the way it treats politics does contribute to public disillusionment and the whole process contributes to people, good people, not wanting to be part mm. of that process. Mm. It may be, it'd be very hard to measure really whether the politicians we have are better or worse than, than half a century ago or a century ago because it would depend on your criteria. But we do know that a lot of people would say, well, I won't have a bar of all this. Mm. I want to throw over to the, the, the three current politicians um, and on this issue of media, and I don't want to spend too much time on it, but what is, I'm going to give you a bit of a free kick here, what is something that you, you all feel media could do to engage better with you to, to help the democratic process? Well, I think, um, I, I suspect the three of us might end up saying something very similar, but from my perspective, uh, I'll make no comment on the media per se, but the biggest disappointment of three and a bit years now in the Senate, the biggest disappointment is that 99.9% .9 of Australians never see what we actually do. Yes, it is a Westminster style, um, an adversarial style, um, and if we don't like it, we had changed the style of our democracy in our parliament. A bit difficult, but the fact is, most of what we do is bipartisan, 
it, most of what we do is together. And there is, you know, so there is some very big differences that are played out very spectacularly. And that is, the, that is the good news for the media. That's what will get attention. But the things that... I, I mean, I've done some wonderful things in Papua New Guinea with Cathy. Luke and I are now doing things in defence, you know, yesterday. We're working together on world-leading modern slavery legislation, on getting young people out of aged care, and getting people out of overseas orphan kids who are trafficked in orphanages. There are so many things every day that we do through committees and through the parliament that is bipartisan, and it just breaks my heart that people do not see that. Now, I don't think it's just the, the media's fault, but it's, it's very hard for us because we do these things, and we all do them, mm. and nobody hears about it. So, the two things about this is that we are in this position because we agree with the trust thing, so we've taken up the challenge. That's what... So you, and 150 of us in Parliament are the same, truly. You don't do this because... Anyhow, you do it... Everyone goes in for good reasons, whether or not you agree with them. I want to say that. I want to agree with what you're saying about the, um, the cooperation. So I think it's 86% of all legislation passes through Parliament without a vote. A huge... It's only very small numbers that vote. But what I would like to say to the media is that there's a difference between urban and rural. Like, so I'm a, ru I'm a rural regional electorate, North East Victoria, and my, my media and I have a... I'm not going to say it's... I, I, can't have, I was going to say love, but it's not like that. They turn up. Every time I put on a press conference, they come and they report it. TV, radio, newspapers. And they are so thorough. They watch the... Um, they watch... I'm extraordinarily lucky. So well, it was not only luck. It's got to do with we ran this campaign. So people actually pay attention because they want to know that I'm delivering. So I said, trust me, so they've got to watch out. So we use the social media really well. We broadcast all the speeches we're doing, all the committees we're on. The newspaper, there's three or four journalists who follow it really closely. Every Friday when I go back home after being in Canberra for a week, we have a press conference. They've watched everything I've done all week. Um, so I'll be absolutely hammered about community energy tomorrow. Hammered. And the, so it, it's, it's really, really good. And if you live in Indi and I'm some of the neighbouring electorates, we've got a fantastic media. Every town's got a little... still got really good newspapers. We've got nine community uh, radio stations that are run by volunteers that do news. And then we've got the, the bigger TV stations and the bigger newspapers. So in rural and regional Australia, most people know what their politicians are doing, and not the senators, the local politicians, and they've all got opinions about us. And it's not about agreeing. So they might like me sometimes, but God, I don't agree with what she did on penalty rates. She really stuffed it up. And did you see what she did on such and such? Yeah, but she came to my mother's birthday party. She turns up, you know, <laughs> and she wrote me a letter. And yeah, I know, I know that, but you know, she gets the kids involved, so she does this. So they actually have this quite informed discussion about your character and your performance. And I think when you came, um, if I could say, Michelle, when you came and did the research during the last election, that's really what you heard. It wasn't that everybody liked me or even agreed with me. It was that, okay, as a representative, I, I was, I, my intention was pure-ish. And so they could trust that. <laughs> okay. Cathy, you, you, you mentioned that uh, everyone that gets into to Parliament does so for, for good reasons. But once they do, we see a lot of them change and we see a lot of them immediately start focusing on getting re-elected before we've actually seen them do a great deal. Now, Luke, I'll throw this over to you. The issue of strong leadership has become a bit of an obsession with the media and, and I think, with the Australian public uh, and a focus on ev every action being about leadership or a challenge to leadership. How, how true is that, though, behind the scenes? How much focus are, are your um, colleagues on the issue of leadership and strengthening leadership? Uh, I, was a, I was a staffer for a little while um, during the Rudd-Gillard years, so I saw from a, a bit of a distance um, the leadership rumblings and, um, and it, how destructive it was. Uh, it's great to be part of a team when, where everyone's like, We've got a leader, it's Bill, uh, and we're all behind him. Uh, it must be difficult when you've got a leader that says, I'm a strong leader, um, as Malcolm has recently. Um, it, it's a hot tip. If you need to tell people you're a strong leader, 
then there's probably something a little bit um, astray. Let, let me just uh, take it out of Australia for a moment, though, to focus on the issue of populism. When we see something like the Trump in, in the States and, uh, and, of course, with Brexit and what have you, and we're seeing a, a popular movement that is, seems to be calling for strong leadership, and yet we get the Trumps of the world that, that offer strong leadership and pretend to be part of the people th to take back the country uh, you know, away from the elites and the power, the, the power hunger yeah. and what have you, which is actually quite a contradiction anyway. Don't you see, though, that that is potentially reflecting or beginning to reflect here in Australia also? Probably. It's becoming probably a little bit more um, personality driven. So there's obviously a, a, a lot of people in the lower middle classes in the States um, that were probably job insecure, uh, had declining uh, wages uh, and were feeling um, left out and seeing that the, the establishment polit politics or political system wasn't serving them anymore. Uh, so here was a guy and I think every attack on Trump they sort of see as a bit of an attack on them. So that sort of personality uh, driven and even if they don't believe uh, that, that Trump's going to make the Mexicans build the wall, mm. um, they agree with the, the themes mm. of what he's saying. So they're, they're responding. They don't really care whether he's not telling the truth, but they like uh, what he's saying. If I can just quickly say something about um, good people not getting into politics. I think there is more scrutiny uh, from the media and also through social media. And if you cast your uh, minds back to when politicians were drinking in this room, as soon as the second broadsheet for the day um, was put to bed, you probably kick, kick your heels up, mm. drink together, have blues, um, thrash out whatever it is that you felt you needed to thrash out. You didn't need to worry about someone taking a photo of you and put it on social media. And there was probably a little bit more collegiality. I don't know if that's a naive view of mine or not, but I get the feeling that in the good old days, there may have been a bit more, uh, less scrutiny by by the media, and I'm not saying that's a good thing, I think we should be scrutinised, but I think the increase in scrutiny probably keeps some people away. And just finally, just on professionalism in, uh, in, in politicians that come, come along, uh, I was a military officer for 13 years, uh, started a charity in Timor and worked in Indigenous health in the Northern Territory, then decided to go into politics. But when I did decide to go into politics, I went and became a staffer for federal parliamentarians because I thought doing politics is a thing, like it's a trade, it's a bit of a, a craft. If, you're gonna, if I'm going to be successful, if I'm going to do the best thing by my uh, constituents, I'm going to have to learn how this game, this game works. Um, and so I think we, there's a danger of us having too many uh, factory-run um, candidates that become politicians, but there, there is a, a need for a little bit of an understanding of this context. Mm, okay. I'm going to throw it open to questions from the floor. Now, Justin has a microphone. Just while a microphone is coming to you, Linda, just want to throw over to you while we're waiting for that question. As someone who's been a strong advocate for gender equality in politics, coming back to populism, populism uh, at its core evokes a strong sense of paternalism. I think, um, a, 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 a you know, strong leader who will look after uh, those who, who, who are in need of direction, leadership. Do you see this as being a, a threat um, or a bad thing for women because it, it operates from that sort of hierarchical, uh, top-down um, uh, use of power? No, I don't, and I'll explain why. Populism seems to have emerged as a sort of developed as a concept now about that sort of authoritarian masculine sort of approach. But to me in politics, populism is actually saying things people want to hear, saying things that are popular and people agree with. So that in itself, I don't think is a bad thing in politics. In fact, I think it's really good if you actually understand what people, if you're engaging with them enough to know what'll get their head nodding and say this, that's what I want. The real trick in politics is not just to say to everybody what you want to hear, but also to say, well, I can't deliver that, but I can deliver this. And it's one is the honesty, but also the accountability. So to say, well, look, yes, I know this is what you want, or yes, this is what you want, but this is what I can deliver and hold me accountable to it. So that's where I see the disconnect with populism and the rise of people, you know, as um, Michelle has said in, in our own parliament, because people are saying what people want to hear, 
but then of course they can't, de they can't possibly deliver it. So for me in terms of gender, I think that gender equality and you know, full equality and is really important and most people, I'm sure all people here would say, well that's actually a really good thing, that's a popular thing to say. But the real question is how do you go about achieving it mm. and how do you actually implement it? And that's the really hard bit on you know, so many issues in politics. And just in terms of leadership, I, the last thing I ever wanted to do, I worked in politics for many, many years and I worked mostly throughout John Howard's government. I didn't agree with him on a lot of things, but like so many people, I respected his leadership and he had a really good, strong team. And that's, I think, is for, for many, many reasons, and I certainly wouldn't point the fingers at, at politicians because, you know, all the politicians I know, are, you know, we're human. Um, Catherine um, from The Guardian, she wrote this brilliant article, Catherine everybody, Murphy. Catherine mm -hmm. Murphy, that resonated with every single politician because she said things we can't. We are normal human beings. And you know, years ago, as Lucas said, you know, you could do, you could be a human being. You could engage. You could talk. You could stuff up. You could have a bad day, a good day, and it wouldn't be straight on social media, and you wouldn't be condemned for saying, you know, saying the things that everybody else says. So that puts extra pressures in the fact that people don't accept. They say, "Oh, you're not real." But if you are real, you know, like if I have a bad hair day, or if I say something really stupid, or I just get cranky, and you know, I do get cranky. We all do. We can't, we can't be sick, we can't be human, we can't you know, dis display or, those things. Or we have to accept that this is the new reality and we have to work with it. But we're rather, not, rather absolutely. than blame the technology but it's not for or us the media cycle. Again, it's not for politicians to change in that sense because we can't turn ourselves into superhumans mm. um, in that sense. So it's accepting... Um, in preparation for tonight, I was thinking about this gender question. So when I ran for parliament in 2013, all the leading candidates were women in this rural seat. So we had Sophie Mirabella for the Liberals, really strong, assertive leader. We had Kathy McGowan, local community leader. We had um, Jenny O'Connor, Greens candidate, fantastic, now mayor of Indigo Shire. We had um, Robin Walsh, um, again, a very strong community leader. And so we came in one, two, three, uh, Jenny came fifth. And the, watching since the development, it was the most fantastic experience as an early starting politician to be part of when no one pulled the gender, the gender card because we were all women. No one said, no one ever made a note that we're all women together. And we just went hammer and tongs in a most amazingly competitive way. But the really good thing for me about it was, again, back to the competition. We were all up for the competition and we loved the competition. So we didn't shy away from it, but we differentiated as women. So Sophie, who many of you know, because she had such a national profile, she was a particular type of politician. And I, there was no point in me taking, um, I didn't want to compete with her in that way. So I deliberately juxtaposed myself as not being anything like that. And so in the next election they called the, I can, what was it, the kind, the nice and, the queen of nice and the queen of something else. So, you know, the media picked it up. But so that was really exciting to be there when actually you weren't, you could actually be a really strong, combative, clever, articulate person and no one made any comment about your gender. When I, when I searched, um, for, did some research for tonight um, on, you yeah, what makes an ideal politician and I, Googled uh, honest politician and I come up with <laughs> Kathy's predecessor. Oh. <laughs> B because it said that um, she'd come out and said that if no people had voted for her, they would have got a hospital. She was totally <laughs> honest about it. So that well, was interesting. Uh, we'll come back to the ideal politician, but Michelle, just I, a brief response. I just you. wanted to make one point uh, in your. Um, reference to populism, the, the sort of definition that you were using, to point out that, of course, the the leader of populism in the parliament at the moment is a woman. Hanson is the populist leader. So Very good point, it's, yeah. It's not uh, gender yeah. exclusive by any means. No, no, it's not all Donald Trump. I, I, well, John. I, I just John. think, that, I think this, uh, the discussion around populism is interesting. I, I'm one of those that believe that uh, Kevin Rudd's, uh, the beginning of his fall from grace was because he didn't actually understand the popular mood for action on climate change. 
uh, and if you use the definition of what a majority of people want, a majority of people in Australia at that time were very interested in Kevin Rudd pursuing his commitments in relation to climate change, and it was his failure to, to deliver what he promised, a popular promise. And I think the other, so I think it's very interesting, well, what is popular and how do you read the, the community mood? And uh, put this, this expectation that people will respond to the community mood. And the other issue, which I you know, that needs to be discussed in relation to populism and attitudes to, uh, I think, our, our federal parliament is, um, you know, the, the position of both the Labor Party and the Liberal Party on asylum seekers and refugees is um, sheer populism, uh, as bad or worse than anything Pauline Hanson's delivered. Okay, great Stop point. The votes is the most popular slogan you can Absolutely. Stop the votes. Stop the boats, yeah, a very a mantra a very of both Labor and Liberal. Um, I'm going to, because we are running out of out of time, I think I should call on the waiters to start serving the wine and the champagne and we'll just keep talking. Um, we do have a question over here. Um, we are going to finish off on the ideal politician, one idea from each of you, but your, your question, sir. Uh, I'm David Purnell. I've been a long time resident of Canberra. In fact, my parents attended the Jubilee celebration here in King's Hall. Yeah. In 1951, when Ben Chifley died, the, the night he died, so it was quite an amazing m memory. Um, I'm interested in vested interests. John Stanhope referred to the citizen jury problem, and yet it seemed to me that as soon as it was announced, the vested interests who had a particular interest in insurance matters and so forth were in the paper immediately saying, what a ridiculous idea, giving this to the people. And so it seems like there's going to have to be quite a bit of uh, groundwork laid to make those things work. But in general, we've heard quite a lot more in the media recently about vested interests and how much power they have. I wonder if any of you would like to comment on how, how as a politician you resist that. Okay, vested interests. All right, well, just very briefly, over to you, Linda. That's a great question and I think it's at the heart of what we should be discussing here tonight. For example, I'm chair of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, which looks at the electoral system, the um, Electoral Act, and makes changes and reforms. So today, we're at the moment, we're dealing with the really easy issue of political donations and disclosure and, you know, all of that sort of thing. But what was very clear is having a look at the last 10 years, there's been so many bipartisan recommendations on how to reform the political donation system. And everybody is in thunderous bipartisan agreement we need to do it. Just nobody can actually agree on who it actually applies to. And so one of the things we thought to break the deadlock on that is we've, as a committee, incredibly bipartisan because we're all committed to our electoral processes. So we thought we've got to do something a bit different. So we've issued a discussion paper. We've sent it out to a whole range of people and said, look, what problem are we trying to fix? What do people actually expect of us? And how do we reform that, you know, because the Electoral Act was written in a political campaigning time that no longer exists. So instead of trying to retrofit today's campaigning into the past, so the really interesting thing is, of course, we get the usual suspects who've made submissions um, and we haven't quite yet heard from, um, you know, people that we want to hear from. So we're actually going to try and, again, so your experience is very interesting, is actually get out and have panels and talk to people. What do you actually expect of politicians? What do you actually expect in terms of transparency? How does that match with freedom of speech? Because obviously we, it's very difficult to make a lot of decisions because it does. So but it is the squeaky voices and the interest groups. But again, coming back to the same-sex marriage debate, it shows that people do care, and if you find ways to engage them and hear their voices so that they feel that it matters, I, I, you know, I think that's the way. So I don't, I'm not sure with electoral matters we've exactly nailed that yet, but that's what we're trying to do. Okay, I want to throw this, uh, the issue of vested interests over to you, Michelle, because as a, a, a person in the media, you get it sort of from both sides. Well, I, look, I think that, that vested interest is a very, very big topic and we could talk for an hour just about that. Obviously, firstly, there have always been vested interests throughout our political history. Secondly, there are obvious vested interests, business, unions, uh, big uh, sort of groups in the community, farmers <coughs> through farming organisations and so on, and they will have ins to the the party, all the parties or, or some of the parties. But I think one important point is 
that the growth of the lobbying industry, and I might put this under my professionalisation of politics heading, has also changed and to some extent distorted the process. So it means that uh, some people get more access than others, can buy access. Mm. Uh, donations provides another way of buying access, whatever mm. disclaimers the politicians uh, might give. And I think that people are aware that the ordinary person who doesn't employ a lobbyist and, and uh, can't pay a lot of money to go to a fundraiser is is not on a level playing field. Mm. There is not mm. a level playing field, we, we must admit. And, of course, the parties, the major parties, who have the problem, incidentally, on the membership level of being totally hollowed out these days, so they have very mm. few members anyway, and that's a, a, another whole set of problems. But if you look at modern election campaigns, the leaders during those campaigns, after they've done their events for the television cameras during the day, will spend their evenings uh, at fundraising dinners, private dinners. Now, I think probably 30, 40 years ago, they would have spent more of their evenings at dinners, admittedly, to get money, but where the, the um, entry uh, charge was, was quite low and affordable by party members, but uh, those dinners of party members or even members of the public, but the whole thing has has changed and has built in uh, another level of vested interests. Okay, I'm gonna take another uh, question from the floor. We've got one just here and then another one over here. Hi, thank you all for your insights tonight. My name's Adele Lausberg. I'm doing some PhD research into the capacity for federal politicians to work together across party lines. I was wondering if you could give us some insight into the appetite for that within parliament and also as a follow-up, whether or not you think that could help with rebuilding some trust from the community. Great question, thank you. We've touched on that a little bit about, and we've already heard about some collaboration that's going on, but will it actually impact on the issue of trust? Uh, that's a Look, it's huge. I don't know if you've heard about this thing called parliamentary friends of. So I could spend my whole time going to parliamentary friends of, like, health and all the sorts of topics with my colleagues learning about stuff. There is absolutely no shortage of collaboration and it works. And we get most of our work done by me going to you and me going to you and saying, look, here's the problem, what do we do? Have, and we're doing, we got committee work. It comes out of it, we work together all the time. So the thinking it doesn't happen is just the little bit of question time you get. And it's, it's that's, but the thing about trust is not about that. The thing about trust is delivering for your community in a way that values and gives them the expectations are matched. So we could be doing it all we like, but if it doesn't match the community's expectations of how we behave, they're never going to trust us. I've, I've got a very recent example where from the Northern Territory, there's four federal parliamentarians out of 226. Um, so we've got to look at every way we possibly can to, um, to uh, strengthen our voice down here in Canberra. So I ran with uh, Senator Nigel Scullion uh, a bipartisan event. Yes, sorry. Yeah, just explain that he's governor, your opposition. Yeah. So yes. Yeah, so yes, yeah, Senator Nigel Scullion uh, from the CLP or the Nationals um, is a cabinet minister in the current um, Turnbull government. Uh, so I joined with him to organise an event called Facing North, uh, and the response that we got from that from the members of the business community from the Northern Territory that came down. Uh, and from people back in Darwin when I got back there, everyone thought it was absolutely fantastic and it did at some level, I think, start to rebuild some trust uh, because there was a... Because people would say, if there's one thing that does my head in is that you guys can't uh, agree more on things. And as uh, Linda and Cathy have said, the majority of things uh, that we do do in the parliament uh, are agreed on a bipartisan level, but I guess through the media, what people see is where we disagree but there was a resounding uh, support of us working together to promote the Territory uh, Very in Parliament. Very quickly, can I just give you another example, from just a, another one from Western Australia. Uh, I'm, for all of the Brumbies fans here, my apologies, but I initiated a Senate inquiry into the Western force being cut out of the uh, Super Rugby League. Now, I'd never been to a game before, I have to confess, but 
something was not right. West Australians were extremely unhappy. So that went through, not only did all West Australian senators support it, you know, doesn't matter party, but the entire Senate supported mm. it as well in solidarity. So mm. this happens all the time, but again, who hears it? And that's one of the great tragedies. I must say it is very comforting to hear of such collaboration and cross-party discussion. It really is. We'll take one more question before we finish up by asking you all about your ideal politician. The question just here. Juliana, I'll pass your microphone over. It, it's on, just hold right up close. My name's Les Lando, and um, uh, the rise in populism has brought with it a concept of false news and, and the ability of um, politicians in particular to make whatever claims they like completely unsubstantiated, and with it a decline in trust, I believe, of politicians. The media seems to inflame this rather than calm it. Um, I, I see a way around it of having more fact-checking of some sort in some guise that the um, media could, could assist in. What's your opinion on this? I'd throw that over to Michelle. I might just say about fact-checking, of course, the ABC fact-checking unit was axed due to funding cuts. <laughs> Michelle? Um, well, it's, it's bad when, when it goes, but we do have... Uh, there are some fact-checking outfits about and, and the um, conversation has, um, does fact checking and uses academics. One thing I did notice though, uh, in, I agree absolutely that this should be an answer, but one thing I noticed in, maybe it was the campaign before last, and it was the first campaign where there was, uh, fact checking was quite new, but a figure would be discredited by the fact check but the politicians who'd been using that figure would just continue to use it as though nothing had happened. <laughs> so, um, you know, sometimes uh, maybe if you, had, if you had more of it and more attention is drawn to it uh, and the media collectively uh, have a vested interest in pointing out to politicians that this has been discredited, uh, again, they'll... Um, change on this, but it, it was quite startling that it had as little impact mm. as it, it did in that campaign. Might I just add, though, that um, Michelle Grattan, and I know she'll be embarrassed by me saying this, but I'll say it anyway, is famous as the greatest fact checker in the press gallery. <laughs> and her, it's true. <laughs> Her, um, her they, just, they just condemn me for ringing them in the middle of I the night. I was just going to say, the number of politicians, prime ministers that talk about those midnight calls and the, the spouse will say, oh, it's Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to have to uh, draw to a close, unfortunately, but I do want just briefly from each of you one, just one idea about the ideal politician, what she looks like. So <laughs> we'll go, we'll start with you, Linda. One idea. She looks like everybody else in the community. Very nice idea. She does. Okay, Kathy. So I'm going to get up. <laughs> she, uh, she does. The ideal politician. Thank you. Beautiful answer. Thank you. Luke, can you top either of those? No, I'll give it a go. Um, she looks like John Stanhope. <laughs> she's got the brain of Michelle Grattan. <laughs> she's got some of the integrity of Kathy. Uh, yeah. And I don't know Linda that well, but some of the uh, political, uh, political nous and um, commitment to service um, that I know that she's... Um, been engaged in all her life. Is that okay? That's beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. Thank you. Now, Michelle, you're probably the best qualified here to answer this question. What is the ideal politician? Well, I'm going to say that there's no ideal politician. <laughs> that all politicians who are going to be good politicians uh, must have in, or should should have integrity. That's obviously a central quality. But beyond that, I think it's important in our parliament that we have a total diversity of politicians, people from all sorts of backgrounds and uh, highly educated people, not so educated people, uh, people who um, have 
a great deal of knowledge of the world and others who are very focused on on uh, local constituencies. So I think diversity is a really important thing with integrity at the core. Indeed, absolutely. And most importantly, gender diversity, as we know. John, ideal politician. Um, I was just reflecting uh, with my neighbours here, my constituents, those that did and didn't vote for me. Um, <laughs> it would be perhaps interesting to know, but um, I've always... Would you I've, like them to do a show of hands? <laughs> we, we could, well, well, I know, and uh, I, I know that um, just in, on, the, on the basis of Hare Clark, that, um, and I've done the numbers in terms of my own vote, that 60% of the people in this room never voted for me. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, I think in the context of the, the discussion around trust, and I'm one of those that believes that there is a crisis of trust, that the, the research tells us that, most particularly in our federal <coughs> parliament and, our federal, and, 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 and with our federal politicians. When I reflect on it, I think the, the, that what people uh, want most in politicians is authenticity. Uh, they want to believe that what they see is what they get. Authenticity. Authenticity. And uh, I. I watch the television every night and watch the news and I watch um, my leaders saying things that I don't for one minute think they believe. Uh, whenever I see a member of the Labor Party um, supporting the Labor Party's position on asylum seekers and in indefinite uh, Offshore detention. I yell at I yell at the, t the TV <laughs> screen. I yell. As long as you don't ring up the ABC and no, complain. No, no. I I see them actually justifying uh, our party position on asylum seekers, and I re yell at the television screen, liar, oh, because I don't believe for one minute they believe what they're saying. Well, the the simple answer to that, John, is just stop watching the TV news. It's a waste of time. <laughs> waste of time. I'm now going to call on um, my colleague, Professor Mark Evans, just to give us some concluding remarks. It's been a fascinating discussion. We've covered a range of themes here, and quite frankly, I do think we could, we could talk all day, uh, as long as the wine was, was flowing. But Mark, some concluding remarks. Uh, well, look, I think I'll just pick up the, 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 um, the train of thought from, from John, because I think um, what this conversation has all been about is authenticity and I think uh, more conversations like this would have a huge impact in terms of, in terms of bridging trusts with, with Australian citizens because I think ultimately this shows that you are all human, right, that you are empathetic, right, and you want to do the best for Australia and its citizens. But what is important is something's getting in the way quite clearly in terms of communicating that to, to the wider public. Um, so again, I think the media has to play a key role in actually capturing the magic of that collaboration that's been articulated in various ways through, the, through those stories. And I know that one thing that we can do here actually is, is, to, is to capture those stories and, and disseminate them more broadly because I think it's so, so important to get, to get the messages out that, you know, there's more to... You know, the whole notion that, that you are here basically to improve the conditions of, of everyday Australians and demonstrate how you're doing that in a whole range of different ways I think is so, so important. So I'd like to thank the panel uh, for, for giving of their time to be with us this evening and sharing um, their insights with us. Um, I'd also like to thank our wonderful facilitator, uh, Virginia Hauserger. And I'd like to thank the Museum of Australian Democracy for providing a wonderful space for us to debate these issues. So thank you to Daryl and her, her team. Look, the only thing that I would end with is that it is true that at the moment the ACT government is, is experimenting with new ways of doing democracy. But we all have to remember that it's all in the doing. It is all in the doing. So how people are invited to participate in these activities is absolutely fundamental to getting the right outcomes. So we have to make sure that when we engage in public participation, we engage in it with a degree of consideration and thought to how to get the best outcomes. Thank you, everybody. And on that note, we have a, uh, a task for you. 
This report that um, IGPA has put together following on from the research that was done and then the meeting in this very room of 100 champions of democracy has resulted in the drafting of a charter of democracy and you can find it on our website which is the governanceinstitute.edu.au. I think best if you just Google IGPA, I-G-P-A at the University of Canberra, it's the Institute for Governance and drill down to our recent reports. If you go to publications, recent reports, and you'll find uh, this image. And in this document is a one page draft of our Charter for Democracy. And we would love you to have a read of it and then let us know what you think, because this charter will then form part of the exhibition here uh, the Power of Us, which will open next year, and we think it's a terribly important document, and we'd like as many of you as possible to comment on it. We've already had some wonderful comments from the 100 champions that were in this room for that historic uh, evening gathering, and uh, we're very excited about what that charter will then do and how that will help progress this very discussion. So now, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's time to get together share a drink and talk some more. Thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>